I understand from our records that we have participants from many different nations. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you are. The diversity and richness of our audience promises what will be an encouraging and, stimulation and stimulating session. With no further delay, I give the floor to Professor Gita Steiner Ramsey, Director of NORAC and of the KICS EAP Hub. Please. Hello, everybody. It's good to see you or to be part of this group. I will just say a few words acknowledging uh, that this is part of the KICS GPE IDRC NORAG initiative. And this webinar is originally specifically for Europe, Asia, and Pacific. But of course, we all, uh, you know, we welcome anyone who is interested in the topic. So a warm welcome on our behalf. Uh, there are five partners that we have. One of them is FHI 360 in this KICS GPE project. Another one is Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. A third one is Acer in Australia. A fourth one is UNESCO Bangkok. And the fifth one is UNICEF Regional Office in Geneva. And eventually the webinars will be very much participants driven, demand driven. And all the participants, there are 21 countries that participate in the KICS uh, GPE project. They will say on what topic they would want to have webinars. Until this is starting or kicking off, as we would say, we invited our strategic partners, FHI, Acer, and the others to present webinars on their topic of expertise. So this is to give you a background, uh, and we are very happy that FHI 360, and specifically Brian Dooley and Yvonne Kao agreed to be the first presenter in the first webinar. Having said this, let me pass back the floor to uh, my colleague, Jose Luis, the hub manager. Thank you, Professor, for your welcoming words and for setting the context for today's webinar. The webinar today is facilitated by our partner, FHI 360, that works in more than 60 countries in the field of human development. We know that COVID-19 is an ongoing concern for us all, and this was confirmed among all the participants of the KICS EAP launch held 27 of May. So this webinar responds to countries' demands and draws on how to conduct monitoring and evaluation during these times of uncertainty. I want to briefly outline our webinar agenda that you can see in our shared screen. We will start by having a short poll aimed at understanding our participants' level of familiarity with m and &E. We will then proceed with Yvonne Kao's presentation of guiding principles and questions. Yvonne Kao is a technical advisor in FHI 360 Research and Evaluation Department, where she provides technical assistance for a number of education projects. She has extensive experience in managing complex data collection and impact and performance evaluations in education, youth development, and agriculture. Yvonne holds a master's degree in international education policy from the Graduate School of Education. After Yvonne's presentation, we will have our first Q&A session. This will be followed by a second poll related to Brian Dooley's presentation on options available and best practices. Brian Dooley is a data capture and utilization officer in FHI Research and Evaluation Department, where he designs and provides training on data collection tools for a number of education projects. He also builds interactive monitoring dashboards and leads capacity building activities for partner governments. Brian holds a master's degree in international education policy from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. In the end of Brian's presentation, we'll have a second Q&A session. After that, we'll move to the closing uh, remarks. Okay, great. So just very quickly again, I'm Yvonne Kao. I'm a technical advisor in the research and evaluation team of FHI 360. And I'll be presenting today's webinar with my colleague, Brian. Um, 
who works on data capture and utilization with uh, me on, on this team. Um, and um, Jose Luis already went through um, sort of the, the outline for today's session, but we'll be talking about sort of some guiding questions and principles that we've adopted on our projects and activities for adapting our monitoring, evaluation, and learning plans. And then we'll be talking about te technology options for data collection. And then finally, address very briefly some best practices for remote data collection. Uh, but as uh, Paul said, before we do that, then let's take a group photo. And I think I'm going to stop screen share so that we can have the videos of, um, of the participants um, show up on the screen. So I'm going to do that. Okay, so we'll launch our first poll. I think Paul will launch that. It's, uh, so you, currently should, running. You, should see, you should see a poll running. It has two different questions. Um, the first question is, what is your level of familiarity with monitoring and evaluation, just so that we can get a little bit of a sense of who's in the room today. And then the second question is, what are your primary reasons for joining us today? Um, and obviously, if none of these response options fit, then you can just leave this blank. And I believe that our interpreter, Lita, is also translating these questions for the, for the Russian speaking people. Итак, первый, uh, первый вопрос звучит следующим образом. And as you're doing this, I've been seeing all of the introductions in the chat, so please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. It's really nice to see a very wide range of organizations represented today. Um, I saw a lot of my colleagues from FHI 360, but also people from UNICEF and UNESCO and a lot of other organizations. So about 60% of people have voted so far. Oh, you closed the poll already, right? Okay, so let me show the results then. Okay, so um, a few people don't really know what m and &E is, so that's good to know. 27% um, said that they don't know the basics but don't practice m and &E. And then the majority of, um, of the participants today are beginner to intermediate m and &E practitioners. And we have quite a few expert m and &E practitioners as well. And the primary reasons for joining us today is, um, okay, to get ideas for how to adapt MAL plans, which is what I'll be presenting on first. Um, and so we can spend um, then some time in the Q&A to dig into that. And then, um, and then a third of you said that you wanted to learn more about technology options for remote data collection. Um, and then about 20% said that they wanted to get tips for how to adapt in-person surveys to remote surveys. Okay, great, that's really good to know. So I guess most people here are, are pretty familiar with m and &E. um, So let me stop the results now, and then we'll continue with the presentation. Great, so as I said, um, I'm going to be presenting some general guiding questions for adapting monitoring, evaluation, and learning plans. So it's not an actual methodology, like there's nothing very concrete because obviously m and &E plans are tailored to your specific intervention or activity. And so you'll have to think through what's appropriate for adapting your monitoring, evaluation, and learning plan in light of the pandemic that's happening right now. Um, I'm sure most all of you have been affected, um, especially for those of us who work in education with all of the school closures happening um, and the work that we can do, you know, in schools and the communities um, and that we've had to adapt, you know, our data collection activities and indicators and so forth. So I'll be presenting just like um, some, some guiding principles that we've adopted FHI 360 um, to help us think through how to, um, how to pivot and change our m and plans. So for those of you, since there's a few of you um, in the room who don't really know what monitoring and evaluation is, just very quickly, what is a monitoring and evaluation plan? Typically, the first thing that it does, is it will describe um, the theory of change of your intervention or activity. And by theory of change, I mean that um, it describes how the intervention of activity is going to lead to um, to some sort of short term, um, you know, to some outputs, to some short term outcomes, medium term outcomes, and then long term impact. So it articulates that those causal pathways, um, and the M and E plan also defines how the intervention or activity will be monitored and, and evaluated, meaning that it includes some monitoring indicators. Um, it defines their targets and the definition of the indicator. 
it will describe data collection processes. So whether you're collecting that data through surveys or um, through um, maybe just some field, um, field observations, um, who's collecting the data and at what frequency. And an m and &E plan may also include what we call a learning agenda, which is basically a set of learning questions that um, you want to respond to, to better understand perhaps the implementation of your intervention or the impact of your intervention. And it will describe the planned evaluations that um, allow you через проведение оценки вы как раз таки поймете, насколько ваши вопросы работают, каким образом ваши мероприятия были, интервенции были проведены, реализованы. principles and the first one is um, in all that we do we want to minimize the risk of transmission of the coronavirus um, that almost goes without saying that safety is um, the most important factor here um, when we're thinking about safety of our beneficiaries first of all um, that we're targeting with our intervention but also safety of our own staff um, who may be collecting the data and safety of enumerators external enumerators that we may be hiring um, to collect data for us. Um, the second guiding principle is to continue communicating with um, your technical and operational teams. And here I'm looking to the participants who are m and &E practitioners, that as the intervention is being changed, um, that you will want to keep communicating with the technical team to understand how the intervention is being changed so that your m and &E plan can align with those changes. And also to continue communicating with the operational teams. Um, and by operational teams, I mean the administrative staff, the finance staff, for instance, the procurement staff, since uh, changes in the m and plan may lead to changes in data collection, in hiring our enumerators, and in your, in your budget. And then finally, um, you know, for, for those of, of uh, you guys like me who are more of an implementing partner, a reminder to obviously communicate with the funder, that communication is so important to make sure that you're aligned on how your M&E plan is changing. Um, if you're a donor yourself, then it would be communicating with your other key stakeholders, perhaps uh, ministry, government stakeholders. So um, in terms of guiding questions for modifying email plans, we have three main guiding questions. And the first one is to think, first of all, through what indicators are impacted. So as I said, an m and &E plan will usually include um, key performance monitoring indicators, um, and those indicators may need to be changed in different ways. The first consideration is around targets and definitions of the indicator. Um, in some cases, you may want to think about actually modifying the definition of the indicator so that new activities can count towards the, the indicator. Perhaps the easiest example of that is thinking about any training that you've done face-to-face -face so far and that are now going remote and virtual. For um, a lot of our education projects, we are um, shifting to training our teachers in a virtual environment. And so perhaps the way that you define your indicator originally was that you would only count those face-to-face -face trainings, but now you also need to count those virtual trainings. Uh, so you, you will want to modify your indicator definition to take that into account. The second thing is that you may want to modify targets, right? As lockdowns happen, schools closed, um, it's likely that your activities were put on, on hold. And so it's also likely that you may not be able to reach your target for, you know, for the quarter in question or the fiscal year in question. Um, and in that case, then you'll want to think through what that means for your indicators. Um, in a lot of our projects, we've had to lower um, our targets just because we knew that we couldn't reach the same number of teachers, for instance, or the same number of students. Um, a question that I get often is how do we know how to modify indicator, or how, how to modify targets when we don't really know how the pandemic will unfold, when we don't know when schools will reopen, for instance. Um, you can do what is called um, scenario planning. And what is scenario planning? Perhaps that phrase is a little bit uh, unfamiliar to you. Um, it's basically planning for different types of scenario. It's about planning for uncertainty. Um, 
uh, usually if I use the phrase contingency planning, I think that speaks more to people. So basically what it is is that um, you want to define a scenario question. What are the different types of scenarios that you want to plan for? In our case, when we think about indicators, then it would be defining different sets of targets, right? Different scenarios for different types of targets, depending on the situation. And then the second thing that you want to do is identify um, what we call a driver of change. Um, and in, in you know, today's environment, I mean, it may be the timing of lockdown measures or rather when lockdown measures will be lifted. So perhaps, you know, you want to plan a scenario for um, lockdown measures being lifted in a month, in three months, in six months and, um, and you know, different types of reopening plans. And then based on, on these um, drivers of change, then you'll develop different scenarios. And then you, the fourth step will be for you to implement the scenario based on what's happening with this driver of change. So that's in a nutshell what scenario planning is, really planning different types of scenarios for different types of um, circumstances that can unfold. Then the second consideration in terms of how indicators can be impacted relates to data collection. Um, for a lot of, pro of our projects, we've had to switch from in-person data collection to remote data collection. Um, and as I've said, um, shifting to a lot of trainings online in a virtual environment. So for instance, embedding that into an online platforms. And my colleague Brian in the second half of this webinar will talk about different technology options that we have considered ourselves at FHI 360 for remote data collection. Um, the second consideration is around timing of data collection. Um, as your activities are on hold, it's likely that you've had to delay data collection activities as well. And this is especially true if your data collection activity has to happen in person, you know, if you were going to the field. Um, and in some cases, uh, you know, the field data collection could not be changed really quickly to a remote virtual data collection. And then maybe the best course of action is simply to delay the data collection activity. And then the, the third um, sub-consideration here is to think through your sample and your sample design and your sample size. Um, perhaps as the activity is being redesigned now, um, you're shifting geographic focus, or perhaps the rollout plan is different. Um, instead of going to, you know, three different regions all at the same time, perhaps now your intervention is just going to one region um, in a first phase and then a second region and second phase. And that will have an impact on your sample design and how you roll, roll out your data collection activities. Um, if you do this, then um, it'll be important to think through the interpretation of your data and the comparability of your data over time. To define new indicators for your intervention, to capture outputs and outcomes of new activities that you hadn't planned in your original intervention design and that actually didn't figure in your original theory of change. Um, another thing that you may want to consider is including what we call sentinel indicators. Um, sentinel indicators are the same thing as contextual indicators to to be able to monitor the changing environment, so to be able to monitor the context. So let me give you some examples. So for instance, on some of our projects, um, even though there are um, education projects, um, we've been asked by some of our donors to think about how we can help in um, COVID-19 prevention. Um, and so on some of our education projects, we've been distributing uh, personal protective equipment kits, um, or we've been asked to do communications campaign to help with COVID prevention. Um, so uh, the two indicators are on the screen here are examples of two new indicators that we've had to add in our M&E plan. So the number of PPE kits distributed and the percentage of the target population that adopts key behaviors related to COVID prevention. Um, and on contextual indicators, that's a question that I get a lot too. What, what do we mean by contextual indicators? Um, what we mean by that is that you may want to monitor contextual factors that you don't necessarily have control over directly with your intervention, but that would affect the implementation of your activity. So a clear example of this, you know, in two, in two То есть, в принципе, вы смотрите только на то, как оно непосредственно эта ситуация влияет, например, экономическая ситуация reopening dates of schools so that, again, you know when you can start implementing activities um, and then align your M&E plan to that. 
The second guiding question for modifying male plans relates to your evaluation activities. So it's about thinking through what evaluation activities or research activities are impacted. As I've said, um, it may be that now you've had to change your activities um, in light of what's happening. And so if that's the case, then you'll want to think through what is this new intervention, right? This modified intervention. And does this new intervention actually lead to the same outcomes use, using the same logic model or using the same theory of change? Um, so um, that may call for reviewing the theory of change that you originally had in your ME plan and to map out um, changes in outcomes outputs and outcomes, and then ensure that your original research or evaluation question is still relevant based on this new theory of change. Um, another consideration is that you may want to simply delay data collection, which we've already said earlier, um, not because you can't go to the field, but also because you want to allow sufficient time to elapse to be able to measure changes in your outcomes. Uh, since a lot of our activities are on, on hold right now, um, it doesn't make sense, you know, to do data collection right away if you know that you're not going to be seeing an effect. The second consideration is to plan for uh, the possibility that your intervention is not going to show an effect. So if findings show no effect, um, then the question becomes, is it because of the quality of your intervention or is it because of these external circumstances that are happening right now due to the pandemic? And to be able to plan for that, you may want to consider uh, focusing more on measuring what we call fidelity of implementation. Um, and on intermediate outcomes rather than just the long-term outcomes so that you can show that your intervention had an effect along your causal pathway, along your theory of change, even though perhaps it didn't have an effect on your long-term desired outcome. Um, and another thing that you may want to think about is identifying other unintended negative or positive consequences of what's happening right now. So sort of broadening your evaluation or research question to consider that, perhaps adding some qualitative data collection to capture those unintended consequences. Um, let me dig deeper into what I mean by measuring fidelity of implementation in case that concept is not familiar to, to you. Um, the the definition of fidelity of implementation is basically the degree to which an intervention or program is delivered as intended. So if you think about an intervention, uh, what happens usually is that you design your intervention, um, then you implement it, and you assume that as you're implementing it, um, the intervention design is being adhered to, that you're basically implementing the way that it was designed, and then that will lead to main outcomes and results. Um, and um, a lot of the evaluations um, of intervention will focus on measuring those main outcomes and results. But what we're suggesting instead is that perhaps now you want to refocus your evaluation to measure this intermediate step to understand whether your intervention is actually being implemented as design. So for instance, on education projects, you know, um, a basic theory of change is that if you train teachers, then the teachers will change their instructional practices, and then that will lead to improved learning outcomes. So if you can't show that you have improved learning outcomes, what you want to know is whether teachers actually, first of all, were trained properly and whether they changed their practices. Perhaps your teachers actually were able to change their practices, but it didn't lead to improved learning outcomes simply because schools were closed. So then you want to measure the intermediate step of um, teacher practices and teacher knowledge. Um, the second consideration for this guiding question is whether data collection activities are impacted. We already touched on this a little bit, so let me just focus on some other considerations. Um, first of all, you may want to adjust your survey instruments and um, and qualitative data collection, like interview guides, um, simply because you're going to a remote environment. Oftentimes, that calls for you know shortened. Um, survey questionnaires, um, and then uh, perhaps also a resubmission to your institutional review board, so the IRB. Um, as you know, you know any research study needs to go through a ethics approval process with the, with the IRB, um, and it may be the case that you need to review a protocol um, to make sure that your new protocol is approved by your IRB. 
Um, you may also want to emphasize more desk research at this time if you can't go to the field. Um, for us at FHI 360, we do a lot of contextual assessments, especially at the beginning of a project. We conduct um, JESI analyses, which are um, gender equality and social inclusion analyses. We also conduct RERAs. RERAs are rapid education risk analysis um, that sometimes call for primary data collection and field activities. And so um, with everything that's happening, uh, we may not be able to go to the field which means that we are focusing more on desk research and literature review. And then finally, in terms of data collection activities, um, you may also want to use more informal platforms such as WhatsApp and Facebook for collecting beneficiary feedback data, for instance. Uh, and my colleague Brian will talk about the WhatsApp option in a little bit. Um, and finally, the third guiding question is to think through what can we learn from this pandemic? Um, we believe that the pandemic, despite all of the very dis disruptive changes that it's brought about, is also an opportunity for learning. So if you have a learning agenda in your m and &E plan, um, it may be good to revisit that learning agenda and perhaps to uh, modify the learning agenda questions. Or if you don't have a learning agenda, then it may be good perhaps to add a learning agenda. Some illustrative learning questions that we have here, um, and again, they're just illustrative, are to think about how projects are adapting in response to COVID-19, what projects are more successful in adapting than others and why, um, how project modification affect different subpopulations differently um, and how access to mobile technology affect different regions and subgroups differently so sort of thinking through that equity lens um, and then perhaps the third thing is um, to think about whether circumstances and project activities and the way that they're being rolled out now can be um, put to benefit to set up some experiments so for instance if your project is now modified to uh, be rolled out in a phased approach uh, perhaps you can take advantage of this to conduct um, some sort of rapid feedback impact evaluation where you have a treatment group and a control group that you're not going to reach right now but that you're going to reach later. And then finally, you may also want to simply um, add questions to existing survey instruments to better understand the impact of, um, of COVID on beneficiaries and then use that information to inform project design. So I'm gonna stop here and see if, um, I think it's time for the Q&A. So um, we'll see if there's any questions um, that have come through the chat. And I think my, my colleague Brian will help me moderate this. Yeah, thanks Yvonne. So the first question that I have is from Sheila who asks, would you want to have the self-administered style survey instead of delaying data collection? Um, it really depends on your um, on your type of data collection. Uh, for instance, a lot of our data collections are learning assessments with children. Um, they require that an enumerator ask questions orally to the child, uh, you know, if it's a reading or math assessment. So in that case, it would not be possible for the child to do this um, on his or her own. That may be difficult. Um, for, and another consideration is to think about whether your population is literate, right? So if, um, if your target population cannot read, then, then obviously it will also be difficult um, to do a self-administered survey. But if you have a population that's literate, maybe uh, you're targeting um, college students or, you know, uh, another adult population that can read and they have access to the internet, they can do online surveys, um, then yes, you may want to think about uh, pivoting and switching to a self-administered survey. Um, and actually, Brian will talk about that uh, and, uh, you know, we'll go through a decision tree for deciding when to administer what type of survey and using what type of platform. Great, and we have another question here kind of about some of the m and &E technical terminology from Liliana. And she asks, are sentinel and contextual indicators the same thing as proxy indicators? Not exactly. So sentinel or contextual indicators are indicators related to the environment, to your context. Um, so think about um, events that are happening outside of your immediate control that can have an impact on your activity. So I talked about COVID, but another example would be uh, for a lot of our education projects in crisis and conflict settings, perhaps just the number of uh, violent incidents 
um, that are happening, you know, around um, the area where the intervention is being implemented. Or perhaps it could be about tracking political events such as um, uh, things like teacher strikes um, or, you know, school closures related to perhaps um, weather related events. If there's a flood happening, then the schools will close and then you can't implement in the school anymore. So those are the types of indicators that we're talking about when we talk about contextual indicator. A proxy indicator is basically an indicator that um, I suppose in the context of our projects, um, a proxy indicator can be an indicator that will sort of uh, be, that will help you monitor a certain aspect of your activity. Um, so perhaps, um, let me think of a good example of a proxy indicator and Brian, feel free to jump in um, if you, uh, perhaps, you know, let's say that um, you can't, perhaps your indicator is about tracking the number of students reached. Uh, and the way that you've defined it is such that you need to be able to count, um, to count every single in the classroom, but you can't actually do that. Um, so then in, instead of having number of learners reached, um, your proxy indicator would Actually, it's not a really good example. I can't think of anything off the top of my mind. Um, but perhaps your proxy indicator would be um, would be about number number of learners in schools that your activity has reached. So it's not about direct reach, but it's about now counting the number of schools, and then perhaps with the MS data, you can have uh, you can have some estimates of what the number of learners are in those schools. Um, and so that has nothing to do with the context. Um, so, so those two types of indicators, I would say, are quite different. Yeah, and so I think uh, clarifying with Liliana had a follow-up question about just the contextual indicators. So the contextual indicators is really we're trying to understand those external circumstances that might be impacting our M&E. You know, exactly. we might have our ideal situation and we expect all the teachers to go to school, all the pupils to arrive at school, and we simply want to measure learning outcomes. And so the contextual indicators are, what are some of those are intermediate effects that might be affecting kind of our original theory of change that can help us explain differentiation in the m &E results we're seeing? Right, they help you ground truth your assumptions. Um, and I will say that for, for us, a lot of the contextual indicators measurement is based simply on secondary data, you know, that is available out there that you may just want to keep an eye on. We have another question from Olutayo in Nigeria, which I have a few projects in Nigeria, so this is a very relevant question. He wants to know, for scenario planning, what do you do when the authorities where you're working are uncertain or even inconsistent in their announcements regarding school openings or other steps in easing the lockdown? Yeah, so that's exactly when you would want to use scenario planning, right? Um, for us here in the United States, a lot of school districts have been asked to do scenario planning. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen in September when, uh, when the school year starts again. So the school districts have been asked to work on three different types of scenario. A scenario where the students can be in person in schools uh, full time, a scenario where it's going to be 100% online, and then a third scenario where it's a hybrid model of in person and online. And then I suppose that based on the situation come August and where we are with, you know, our number of daily COVID cases and, you know, transmission rate, then the school districts will, will decide which scenario to actually implement. So that's exactly what we mean by scenario planning is that when authorities are uncertain, that's when you want to do scenario planning. So just think through different types of scenarios for when uh, for when schools will reopen, you know, depending on perhaps different points in time. Um, so I can't, you know, I can't speak to your specific circumstance, but perhaps you want a scenario for um, for a hypothesis that the assumption that schools will reopen in September, another scenario for um, schools reopening in November, and perhaps another scenario if schools don't reopen at all um, this coming school year. Um, and then, and then uh, think through what that will mean for your activities and intervention, and then how that will impact your M&E. 
great. I think, do we move on to the next? Maybe we can reserve some questions at the end. So I'll pass the floor to Brian now to go through your section. Great, thanks Yvonne. So just requesting control from you. All right. So oh, hi everyone, first. my name's Brian Dooley. And so as Yvonne tried covering some of the planning challenges that you need to consider when adapting your m and &E plans to COVID, I'm gonna be focusing a little bit more on the how do you actually get that data during this time of social distancing measures and school closures. And so I'm gonna be going over a decision tree that we created to try to help our projects understand how do you pick the right technology or the right method of data collection for your particular context? So before I get into breaking down what the differences are between all these different technology options, we have a, another poll for you where we wanna find out, each of you is, we have a lot of people from different countries here working in different contexts, and so we're curious, what methods of data collection do you have experience with? And so you should see a poll hopefully popping up on your screen now. And we want to find out what kind of technology are each of you using. And if, even if you're not using it now, what technology do you at least have some experience, familiarity with using in the past for data collection? So we'll just take a minute and let the responses come in before I continue. So as the last of the responses are coming in, the way that we think about the different technologies that can be used for data collection during the time of COVID is all about that proximity to the person that you're interviewing. Are you able to actually meet with people in person? And if so, what technology can be used? And if you need to try to collect data from a distance remotely, what are your options? All right, see we have most of the votes in, so I'm gonna go ahead and share our results. Wow, all right, so it seems like the most common method for collecting data among our audience is using online surveys. So sharing a poll or an email through a website, followed by mobile surveys, we are using a phone or a tablet to do data collection. So online surveys, that's great when you need to be socially distanced. You can simply send the surveys to participants and you don't have to worry about physically traveling and then potentially putting people at risk for contracting COVID. But with many programs that are dealing with younger participants who might not either have the ability to read and interact with an online survey themselves or for particular parts of your audience that might not have access to the internet and computers, what are some of the alternatives that you can use? So what I'm gonna do now is just walk us through a decision tree that we created that will help you think of some key questions. Oh, sorry, I'm having some trouble with the screen. Sorry about that, let me just get the slides back to where we were. All right, here we are. Okay, so in order to try to think about what is the appropriate technology for your context, as I'm presenting some of these options, I want you to think about one of the projects that you're working on, think about who you're trying to reach and ask yourself these three questions. First is, can you physically reach your target audience? Is travel permitted? within your country, are there social distancing guidelines that would prevent you from actually having a sort of face-to-face -face interaction? Second, does your target audience have access to either a phone or a computer as an alternate means of reaching them with some survey questions? And then the final question to consider, is your audience literate? Now, using these three questions, 
you can follow this decision tree, which we can share out with you to help you figure out which technology is the most appropriate for your context. So for example, what are the scenarios in place where you can use in-person data collection? When is it more appropriate to use a type of tool that we call remote, but by text? And then finally, what are some of the options for doing remote data collection by voice or through phone? So the first question we're asking is, can you physically reach your target audience? If the answer is yes, that you can travel and meet with respondents in person, then you can use what we call offline mobile forms. Now, many of you seem to have experience using these mobile forms, but what it is is it's essentially a type of software that you can install on any tablet or phone device, and it allows you to enter data and ask survey questions completely offline. And so this is great that if you're traveling in a region that doesn't have reliable mobile network connection, you don't have to worry about your internet dropping and then the survey having to restart over again. You can enter any data you want offline. All of the data is stored on the phone or the tablet device. And then only when you connect to the internet later on, you're able to upload all of your data to a server. Now there's a few different options of software that you can use for offline mobile technology. The most common one is a product called ODK, which stands for Open Data Kit. This was one of the original softwares used to allow you to design surveys that you can enter on your phone. And it's completely open source, which means any one of you could go, if you have an Android device, to the store and then download the ODK app and start using this product yourself. There's other software out there called Survey CTO and Kobo Toolbox and many others that all used this open source ODK software as their starting point and then simply added on extra features for their product. So one of those is called Survey CTO, which takes something very similar to the ODK functionality, which only works on Android devices, and it gives you the option to use iOS or Apple devices if your um, data collectors have Apple phones. Another product that we like to use at FHI 360 is called Kobo Toolbox. And Kobo is great because if you're just getting started in offline mobile forms, you can sign up for a free account and they provide you with server space to upload up to 10,000 results from your survey each month. So just as a simple breakdown between the products, ODK is a product that you can install and set up yourself since it's open source and therefore it doesn't really have any limits on the amount of data you collect. It just relates to the size of the server that you set up for hosting the data. Survey CTO costs about $200 per month, but it has the added advantage of being able to use on either Android or Apple devices. And then Kobo is a great product that lets you start doing mobile data collection for free, and it doesn't require you to have any technical background knowledge of setting up a server yourself. Now, a lot of times the question that I get when we talk about uploading data to a server is what about data security? So for those of you who are not aware, there's something called the GDPR, which stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. And it's a relatively new set of laws that tries to help protect people's personally identifiable information. And it means that anytime that you're collecting data and you're talking to individuals and you're collecting individual level data, you need to make sure that you're in compliance with these guidelines and that you're not going to cause somebody's personal data to be released or shared and used in a way that's inappropriate. So the data that is hosted by some of these common products like Kobo and Survey CTO, you can use it and feel comfortable being in compliance with GDPR. Following certain guidelines. So the way the GDPR works is that there's rules that you need to make sure that strangers can't access your data and that it's limited to a certain number of known individuals. So the easy way of doing this is with any of these services, the data is stored on a common cloud server option like Amazon Web Services. And you can just simply make sure that you have usernames and passwords and limit the number of people who can log in and access your data. And something like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Hosting, they have good security standards in place that you can reasonably expect that your data will be safe as long as you don't start sharing this passwords to your account. Now, 
using a product like Kobo or Service CTO, technically their company's staff can also have access to your data, but they have in their own contract agreements when you sign up for their product, they basically say, don't worry, we're not gonna be snooping around in your data. We only have access to the server just for maintenance issues. So these are generally compliant and safe to use. But if you wanna be able to have true ownership over your data and really limit who can see it, you can set up your own private server and install that open source ODK software. So at FHI, we often set up our own servers, either for our products that we manage, or many times we'll work with a partner government and they want to own the data themselves. And so we often recommend setting up an ODK server using either Amazon Web Services or Microsoft's cloud storage platform called Azure. Now, the monthly cost of setting up one of these servers varies between about $50 a month up to around 150 and the cost simply depends on the amount of storage space that you need for all of your data. So if you have a really big, massive survey countrywide, you're gonna need an extra large server close to that $150 range, but you can start with something smaller for as little as about $40 per month. Now, what if you actually can't physically travel and meet your audience? So this is where most of us are in the COVID-19 context. So sometimes, travel there's an intermediate step where maybe there's free travel between towns and locations but you still want to maintain that social distance and not actually have face-to-face -face interviews in those cases we actually recommend going old-fashioned and using paper data collection so some guidelines for doing paper data collection is we recommend that you prepare your paper survey tools in advance and deliver them to a central collection point in the community where you're working then coordinate with your beneficiaries to have them stagger the time that they come to the central pickup place and then pick up their paper surveys. Now, if your project staff were able to arrange the forms into different piles or areas in the room, by name it makes it easier for people to find their survey, get in and get out, and then minimize the amount of face-to-face -face contact. Then once the paper surveys are completed, you can arrange for participants to return them to that same collection point, and then your staff can enter the data either by manually typing it into a computer or using something that we call OMR, which is a paper scanning technology. So the four ways of entering the data is the scanning bubble forms or manually typing in the results from the paper form either into the offline form like the ODK, an online web form that you can set up for your participants, or even going with something as simple as Excel. We like using the OMR technology, which stands for Optical Markup Recognition. And for those of you who think that might be a foreign term, it's often referred to as the fill in the bubble technology. So if you were ever in school and you took an exam where you needed a pencil and shade in circles for your responses, that's what OMR technology is. And so by purchasing an OMR software, it lets you format your survey with those bubbles and then do mass printing. And then once you get the results, all you need is a good enough quality scanner that can scan those paper forms. And then the software reads the results of the bubbles for you and gives you an output of the data. The offline mobile forms that many of you have experience using in person for face-to-face -face interviews, if your enumerators already have these devices and they have the software on their tablets, you can still pivot to having participants fill out the data themselves on a paper form, and then your enumerators can use their existing devices simply for the data entry. You can also, if you don't already have tablets in place and you have people that are available and have the time to do data entry of paper forms, but don't have phones, but maybe they have computer access, you can set up a free online survey with something like Google Forms or Microsoft Forms that just mirrors the questions on the paper form and becomes a standardized data entry tool. There's more advanced online survey options like SurveyMonkey that give you extra features of doing more complicated types of questions, but with those advanced features comes a cost which can range between $30 to $255 a month, depending on what you're signing up for. There's also another online survey form called Encato, which we like to use because if you already have an ODK or a Kobo form that was designed to work on tablets, 
instead of taking the time to redesign all of those surveys to work as a web form, Encato simply reads the files that work with ODK and Kobo on your tablet and automatically turns it into a web form which you can share out with a URL and a link. Now this Encato product comes for free if you sign up with a free Kobo account, but then it can also be purchased as a standalone product. Okay, but what if you really can't reach your audience? You cannot travel and you truly have to gather data remotely. This is what we call remote monitoring, when you physically can't reach your audience. And in order to do remote monitoring, the people you're trying to reach need to have access to either a phone or a computer. So if your audience has access to a smartphone or a computer, something with internet connection, then you can simply deploy a online survey. So this is what I was referring to before as either that Google Forms or the Microsoft Forms survey. But what about the logistics of making sure your audience actually gets the link to the survey? So if your project already has some channel of communicating, maybe there's some WhatsApp group, there's a way of reaching people through sort of informal means of community leaders, what we recommend is that you take the link for your web survey and you shorten it to something that's simple and easy to share using a service called Bitly. So if you go to this website, bit.ly, they let you take those really long URLs that you usually get from your web survey and it shortens it down to something that's much more manageable that you can then share out through WhatsApp, email, SMS to your participants with a message to click on the survey and send in their response. Okay, but what if your audience has access to a phone or computer, but maybe they don't have the most reliable internet access? Or maybe the phone that they have isn't a smartphone that they can browse online, but it's just a simple feature phone. Then what do you do? Well, if your audience is literate, you can reach them through SMS surveys. So SMS surveys simply work by texting out questions to the participants that you have, and then they can respond to you by simply entering in on their phone's keypad. There's two different forms of SMS questions. One is called a structured SMS, where if you know you're gonna be asking the same three or four questions to your enumerators or participants every time, for example, once a week you want to know how many children attended the classroom, how many of them were boys, how many of them were girls. If you know you have that same format, people can send a text to you with a keyword and enter those three numbers separated by hashtags, and then you can interpret that data and know what each number means. But that requires a little bit of training for people to know how to enter the data the right way. So on some of our projects, we're starting to use what's called interactive SMS. With this product, you can simply design a survey like you normally would, and then you text one question at a time to a participant, and when they send their response back as a text message, the system automatically sends the next question to them. Now, these SMS surveys have uh, additional cost compared to some of the other options. So the way that it works is you design the survey on your computer, it gets loaded to the product's cloud platform, and then it sends the messages out to your participants. So you need to pay for the product that hosts this software for you, and then has what's called a gateway connection, which basically connects your computer where you have your survey questions to the local phone network in the country so you can send it out to the phone numbers that you have. And so this typically has a monthly cost, which can be cheaper for the longer term contract you sign up for. So simply one year contract, you're gonna get a cheaper monthly rate than going month to month. Then you need to budget for the cost of actually paying for those SMS messages. So each country has different rates depending on the network provider. So you're gonna to need to plan how many participants do we want to reach? How many questions do we need to send per participant? what is the price of a text message or an SMS message in this country and multiply those together to get an idea of what your cost is going to be for administering this survey. Then every time your participant wants to respond to you, they are going to be billed the full price of an SMS for sending that response back. So you need to consider, can your participants 
bear the burden of this cost or do you have some method of being able to reimburse them? And then finally, many of the products, in addition to that monthly fee for hosting the service, every time you complete an SMS survey, so a series of those text messages back and forth, when they compile the data for you, they charge you per survey completed. Now, some people think, okay, well, how do I get around those SMS costs? Can't I use something like WhatsApp? Now, WhatsApp is a bit complicated because the company that owns WhatsApp, Facebook, really wants to make sure that this tool is not abused by marketers. We know that the marketing industry uses phone calls and you know you get those random phone calls when you're getting ready to have dinner asking you to buy some product and WhatsApp wanted to make sure that their product isn't overrun by the same type of businesses. So if you simply try sending out survey questions to a broad group of people, WhatsApp is actively monitoring for this and might mark you as spam and then block your ability to send those messages out. So in order to actually do WhatsApp surveys, you first need to register with what's called a WhatsApp business account. Once you have that WhatsApp business account, if you want to send mass WhatsApp messages to a list of phone numbers, you actually have to have your messages approved by WhatsApp in advance. So you literally need to send them, here's the questions that we want to ask, their team reviews it and they'll let you know whether you can ask it or not. And if they deem that it might be spam or annoying to people or somehow marketing, they will block you from sending that message. Now, if you are able to get a message approved following WhatsApp's guidelines, like for example, you're not just asking people a question at random, but if you're asking them a survey question that relates to an experience that they've engaged with you in, then you can use a product that's called a WhatsApp chat bot. And this works similar to the SMS surveys where you can program in advance a series of questions and possible response options to automate a back and forth interaction with your users. And the way that these chat bots work in order to be compliant with those GDPR standards I mentioned before, you need to first send a message to the participants basically asking them if they're willing and they give consent to participate in a survey. If they don't respond, you can't send them any additional messages. Once they say yes, it opens a 24-hour consent window where you can send them as many survey questions as you want during those 24 hours. But if you have 24-hour gap before they reply to you, you need to send out another consent question to reopen that window. Okay, but what if your audience has a phone, but they're not literate? They can't read these SMS messages or these WhatsApp messages. In that case, you're going to need to use telephone interviews. Now, telephone interviews can be done two different ways. And I'll get back to this one in a second, sorry. So if your audience is small enough to call people directly, then you can simply take your existing enumerators, assign them participants to call, give them a script to read over the phone, and they can make manual phone calls and enter their results into one of those online web forms or into a tablet. But if you have too many participants and not enough enumerators to make manual phone calls, then you're gonna need a technology that's called IVR, which stands for Interactive Voice Response. This technology works very similar to the SMS technology I mentioned before, but instead of automatically sending text messages to participants, you simply record your questions as an audio file, and then this IVR system sends those audio recordings by placing a phone call to the participant. So many of you have experienced this before. If you call into a company and you've ordered something online and you don't know where it is, it's late, you call into a hotline and instead of reaching a real person, you hear this sort of computer voice that guides you through a system to help answer your question. So that's IVR technology and you can set it up yourself to actually conduct surveys for people who aren't able to read. So for example, Right now, in one of the projects that I'm working in, in Northeast Nigeria, I'm working with a company called Viamo to do an IVR survey where every other week we call some of our participants and they get these voice questions so we're able to get updates on the COVID-19 situation and the security situation there in Northeast Nigeria.
All right, so that's a lot of technology. And to help you summarize it, we can share out with you this table that sort of organizes what are some of the common products out there for scannable paper, offline mobile, online web form. And now this list is not exhaustive. There's a lot of companies out there, but we want to give you a starting point if you're not familiar with these technologies for what some of the big name companies are and a general idea of the cost per month. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back over to my colleague, Yvonne, who's going to give you some extra tips on some best practices for how you actually go about implementing these technologies. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. So uh, Brian presented um, a number of different data collection uh, platform options. And so as you said, now I'm going to be talking more about best practices, best practices for switching to remote data collection. Um, the first consideration is around ethics and um, IRB. I saw a question in the chat come in asking how do we take care of ethical principles such as confidentiality. And I will say that any sort of confidentiality agreements that you had prior to COVID-19 happening still applying now in times of COVID. Um, and that you'll want to check with your IRB um, how to adjust for different types of data collection. So for instance, if your study was requiring written consent previously, and you are now switching to a phone survey, you will want to obtain approval from your IRB about moving to a verbal consent. Um, and if you're moving to verbal consent or consent given over the phone or using some of these other data collection technology options that Brian just talked about, you may also want to modify your informed consent script so that it is short and simple to understand using very clear language. As with any informed consent scripts, you'll want to include the purpose of the call, who is calling, confidentiality processes, and the duration of the survey. It will be important for you to pilot this internally over the phone to get a sense of how long it takes to administer that consent form and to make sure that your respondent on the other end of the line understands it easily. Um, and just like questionnaire testing, you may need to iterate on it and make several revisions before it's final and before you can implement it. Um, another question that we ask is how you actually document that consent. So the survey protocol that you have, so for instance, if it's a phone survey and you have a data entry template that is on, a, you know, an online form, like a Google form, or if it, even if it's on tablet, that <laughs> И последнее, если, если то есть это должно быть сначала респондентом данного согласия и подтверждено сборщиком информации. И первое сообщение, первое это что? Первое это должно быть, конечно же, сообщение о согласии. И если респондент... Если респондент согласен участвовать в вашем опросе, первое, что он должен предоставить, это свое согласие для участия. Теперь, когда мы поговорили об вопросах этики и согласия, есть еще некоторые моменты. Вы обязательно спросите с большинством данных, извиняюсь, звоните членам вашей аудитории и проводить опрос по телефону. Так, и ответы, конечно, могут быть фиксироваться в реальном времени, либо на бумаге, опять же, используя платформы, которые только что рассказал Брайан. Если у вас качественные исследования по телефону, также можно проводить видеоконференции, например, это фокус обсуждения. Ну, может быть. 
And then overall, it's likely that you'll have to reduce the length of the survey. We know that, you know, a, a phone survey or an online survey typically needs to be shorter than in person. And um, we got another question too over the chat of whether it's possible to train the data collectors to ensure that the data collected is of good quality. So like with any survey, whether it's in person or over the phone, you'll want to train your enumerators for sure. Um, and you may also want to build in extra quality control checks. So for instance, uh, for phone surveys, perhaps a supervisor um, can listen in um, into a sample of the phone surveys that your enumerators are conducting to make sure that the enumerator is asking questions the appropriate way and coding them correctly. If you're not able to do listen-ins when, you know, there's a second person on the line listening into the respondent and the enumerator's conversation, then another option is to do callbacks. Callbacks um, is similar to perhaps some of you know back checks. When you're doing field data collection, it's basically your supervisor going back to the respondent um, either the same day or perhaps the next day or a few days later to re-ask some questions and check the reliability and the accuracy of the data that's been collected. But with anything, um, it's important to test, test, and again, test beforehand and train the enumerators. Another question that we've uh, been uh, receiving in the past is how long does that training take and that's just so dependent on the length and the complexity of the survey that it would be impossible for us to give you really concrete uh, guidelines uh, but we find that if you're having to train people virtually over you know a video platform like zoom like we're doing right now you may want to do more frequent shorter sessions over multiple days rather than having really long sessions since it's a little bit more tiring when you're in front of a screen for that long um, in terms of IVR and SMS surveys, the best practices are sort of similar to the phone survey in the sense that you'll need to be really short. Obviously, you can't have, you know, an extremely long questionnaire that you're administering over SMS. And so you'll need to prioritize which survey questions are really the most important for the purpose of your survey or your evaluation. Um, it's also um, advised to initiate the survey by sending some sort of invitation message to known phone numbers ahead of time, or even share instructions on how to join the SMS survey through other communications channels, perhaps posting a sign in the community, or if you have other communications channels with your target beneficiaries to let them know ahead of time that that's coming. And in general, in terms of boosting your response rate, that was what we'll want to do. Research shows that if you give advance notice to respondents, you'll get a better response rate. Um, since low response rates is typically the main challenge associated with phone, online, or you know, IVR, SMS surveys. So sending an email, SMS reminder ahead of the phone call um, is usually really helpful. Um, a po another possibility is to send the survey through multiple channels, right? So using a multi-mode survey, uh, perhaps you send a survey, uh, you do it on the phone, but you also have an online option. But in that case, you have to be mindful of possible data collection mode effect. And again, I think it will depend on the length of your survey, on your target population, on the types of uh, questions that you're asking. Um, and obviously, during the call, if you're doing a, a phone survey, maintaining good rapport with the respondent is really important. And especially if you can't see them and you can't see their facial expressions, this is something that you'll want to focus on during your trainings. Um, another way to boost response rates is to provide monetary or in-kind incentives, um, and that can also help perhaps in minimizing selection bias and responses. Um, an incentive that, uh, that is often given is simply mobile money or airtime. Uh, for instance, a study in Ghana found that paying three cities per call led to a completion rate of 85%. And then finally, to boost your response rate, just again, consider um, other types of resources that you may have available as part of your project or activity or intervention. For instance, using community members or teachers, perhaps or other types of stakeholders who can help you get that response rate up. For instance, if the teachers are holding online classes already, perhaps they're the ones who can remind students or caregivers to fill out a survey that you send them. So with that, I'm gonna pause here and see if we can take some questions. Um, there's some questions that came in the chat. And for this portion, I think we'd love to hear um, 
we'd love to hear some people's voices. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of questions that came in about sharing the slides and the recording. Uh, the slides will be shared. Uh, the recording is in is currently happening, and I believe will be shared as well um, by Nora again. Kicks. Um, so, there, so there's some questions that that came in, um, and I'm gonna, yeah. I think, have you guys unmute or have. Paul, unmute yourselves. Um, so one question that came in was from Duke Ogbukor. Paul, if you can unmute Duke and perhaps we can hear Duke ask the question that was related to cost, uh, especially of paper surveys. Duke, you're unmute now. Yes, I'm on, yeah, I'm on muted. I was actually, because I was excited with the, the IVR process and uh, I was wondering again with the SMS, within this uh, pandemic uh, period, uh, how much, that, that is a, uh, how much will it, the cost implication, how much will it cost to move in with the, the papers, get them back, retrieve the data, transcribe them to the computer or scan them to the computer, the papers, get the data out the way it's required, get the, uh, analyze to get the quality, and at the same time, be able to be able to to know how much it, my my challenge is the cost because uh, within our setup in Nigeria too, we've been we've been doing a lot of uh, implementation uh, research work in two states in the country that is Kaduna and Lagos and we happen to have uh, told that direction some of the direction which you are talking about and we are looking for a better way to harness reduce costs and uh, come up with proper info and uh, authentic information that it, it can improve the gaps that are to be identified within the implementation research. I was more particular about the cost. Yeah, thank you, Duke. So yeah, I know I know could do no well. Um, for the paper surveys, the software that we use to help us do those scannable paper forms where you can fill in the bubbles is called Remark OMR. And you can buy a license for that for about 1200 US dollars. And what that license does for you is it allows you to have the software to format the survey in the correct way to have all of those bubbles and then be able to print it out. And then the software also allows that once you have the surveys completed and filled in that anybody in your offices in Lagos and Kaduna, if they have access to a scanner can scan those paper surveys, send, the PDF of the scanned files back to you. And then with that one software, you simply read those PDFs into the software and it analyzes the questions for you and gives you a nice Excel readout of the number of people for each response per question. Now, when you're considering the costs of switching to a new technology, I think a lot of times people get scared by looking at the total over cost of doing the printing, getting the software. But what you need to consider is that on many of your projects, you are already budgeting and planning to do some form of data collection. And so it's not an entirely new cost, it's simply reallocating costs in a different way. So if you're already planning on hiring enumerators to go out and take the time to do in-person interviews, you can use those same staff to help you facilitate the distribution of the papers to a site, the collection of those papers, and scanning them into a computer. But the cost of printing all the paper forms is going to depend on the number of people that you're trying to reach. And so what you can do is, as you're considering your sample size, try to figure out with your budget, what is the cost of printing each of these paper forms and distributing them? And then how many people can you reach with that budget? Thank okay. you, Brian. Then, uh, I'm sorry. In addition to that, uh, with the IVR, you know, Nigeria is the place you have over 250 something uh, lang local languages. And uh, most of the communities, even though they may have uh, phones that are not smartphones or smartphones, but uh, probably may not be able to answer or listen to conversation in English, or uh, neither even in Pidgin English very well. But uh, yep. look at this, I'm looking at, so is there a possibility get the documents uh, or whatever message that is, is made as simple as possible translated and incorporated into the IVR system. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I believe that Sheila had a similar question in the chat about dealing with different languages. So for example, what you can do with IVR is at the start of the phone call, the system can simply read out. If you want to hear these questions in English, say English. If you want to hear them in Hausa, say Hausa. And all you have to do for the preparation is if you have staff in country that know each of those languages, you can first prepare the survey questions in whatever language you're most comfortable with. And then you simply need a staff member to record an audio file of them clearly reading out each language, each question in whatever language it is that you need. And then the system will allow you to load those multiple audio files for each question and allow the participant to pick. Now, when you're picking an RV IVR system, it's important to ask whether they allow you to record the audio files yourself. Some companies that I've contacted have their own translators. They record all the audio files themselves and they'll tell you, we offer these 10 languages. There are other companies that allow you to do the audio recordings yourself. So if you do have several languages in Nigeria, you're gonna to wanna to pick an IVR product that lets you do the recordings yourself. Great. I think we're going to get another question. Uh, we'd like to ask Adima to ask um, to ask the question about survey options for assessing reading and math skills. Um, I'm trying to unmute her, but there's um... Let me read the question then if we can unmute her. So the question was, what survey options would you suggest to assess reading and math skills of primary school children in the COVID context? Okay, she says she's sorry because she has kids screaming here. I completely understand. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, do you want to answer? Yeah, so one of the, so there's a few different strategies, again, depending on the type of access that you have. So in some of the countries where I'm working, we're basically trying to do some in-person, socially distanced assessments where we're still traveling to homes and then we're able to have our enumerator stand outside, basically provide a piece of paper, a stimulus for a child to read. They remain six feet apart. They give instructions. And the extra challenge is just making sure that the child is reading loud enough that you're able to hear them. And then they mark the results on a tablet form using one of those offline mobile forms. Um, and in another country, the way that we're doing these assessments is we're actually sending text messages out to parents with a few sentences from the child's curriculum. And we ask the parent to basically show the phone to the child, see if they can read the sentences or the keywords related to the content that week, and then send us back a text message with how many the child got right or wrong. And so we're essentially involving the parents with this administration. In other cases, we have the people that we're serving as teachers actually making phone calls to the homes. And then similarly, the teacher will send a text message with some math questions or some reading questions to the parent in advance. And then the teacher will call the parent, the parent gives the phone to the child, and then the teacher orally administers an assessment over the phone. Thank you. Um, and hopefully that also answered another question that we got about applied learning outcome evaluation methods. Um, so I think now we'll ask um, Sheila Chibore, um, who should be able to unmute and ask the question. There was a question about qualitative data collection. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne, for the presentation and Brian. So I was looking at the issues of data qualitative uh, data collection. We have that aspect is to ensure that uh, we have a, 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 an expert facilitator who's going to, to ask the questions. And then uh, even the facilitator may not be able to join the, the focus group decide and go about it so that we ensure that um, we get all the information as much as possible. Thank you. 
Not sure I completely heard everything, but I think there was a question about okay, the facilitator yes. and the facilitator's role. Um, and I know that you asked the question in the chat, how do we deal with the qualitative data collection such as focus groups that require a data mining process? So if you're doing a focus group in this context and say you had to do it before in person with a facilitator and you're now switching to a phone-based or video-based focus group discussion, you'll obviously still want to have a facilitator that can ask the questions to your respondent. And you will want to have a way to record the focus group discussion such that you can do your transcription and coding um, the similar in a similar way that you would have had to do um, if it had been in person. Now there's other ways to collect qualitative data that we haven't touched upon, which is to use text based methods. So perhaps a chat. Um, if you have, you know, a literate population that has access to a computer again, um, that can be done. And there's also asynchronous ways to collect qualitative data where perhaps there is a, some sort of online forum, you pose a question, and then people can log in and answer the question on their own time. And at FHI 360, one of our colleagues has, has actually done some research to look at whether the quality of the data differs between these different methods you know, when you have a facilitator or where you do it text-based, uh, synchronous and asynchronous. And she found that in terms of um, the quantity of data collected, obviously it'll be very different because when somebody can speak, they can provide a lot more, um, you know, they can just, uh, the volume, <laughs> the quantity of data is larger than when they type. But in terms of the, the quality and the number of themes that, that were covered, um, the oral methods and the text-based methods, but this was done in the context of the United States, which obviously could be different in other contexts. Um, and we can we can share that research if that's of interest. I don't know, Sheila, if that I actually really answered your question. We could not hear you very well, but you feel free to put something in the chat if there are still questions. Um, I think with that, that concludes our Q&A session. We just have a few minutes left before the webinar is over. Um, and so I'm going to turn it back to Jose Luis. And I want to yeah. say thank you so much for participating. Um, yeah, just thank really you enjoyed all of joining. the questions. Yeah, there's a lot of great questions and a lot of good discussion in the chat. Thank you. Well, thank you. We are getting close to the end of our session today. Uh, before we finish, I will invite Hoy Kipigan, a member of our Kix EAP Hub team, to briefly recap the key messages and the big takeaways from today's session. So please, Hoy. Yeah, thank you, Jose Luis, and thank you to everyone for participating in this webinar with uh, FHI 360, Kix, and NORAC. So my name is Hoy, and I'm part of the Kix management team. So COVID-19 has certainly impacted the way we conduct monitoring, evaluation, and learning, and each of us from different organizations and countries have sort of identified and um, contextualized these challenges. So I want to briefly, briefly highlight some of the key takeaways that we can all agree on and sort of summarize some of the themes and questions um, that were brought up during uh, today's webinar. Um, one of the theme is that pan pandemic is an opportunity for learning. So like sort of building off of COVID-19 and using this pandemic as a frame of analysis to modify or develop a learning agenda um, and looking at how and why some projects are more successful in adapting in response to COVID-19 than others. Um, and one of the major themes is around understanding your target audience, which is looking at demographic and whether they have access to technology, internet, or are literate. Um, and this will determine how you collect your data and whether you should use self-administered surveys, phone surveys, among many other um, options. Um, so another important question raised during this webinar was in regards to um, scenario planning. Um, so, and this is really crucial, especially in areas where you cannot really rely on authorities in resp um, uh, when their announcements are uncertain or inconsistent. So um, the scenario planning is crucial in a sense that it um, makes you plan ahead and consider different types of scenario. Um, and also when it comes to identifying the right technology to use. Um, Brian uh, mentioned the technology decision tree, which sort of helps you um, assess your target audience, um, whether it is by uh, paper data collection or 
or offline mobile forms. Um, and then some of the themes that emerged was like cost and languages and um, the types of survey um, options to assess readings um, in, in cases of schools. Um, and then one of the major challenges that we've heard from participants is in regards to online or internet access, which is not a privilege that everyone shares. And so this will continue to be something to consider and keep in mind, especially um, in certain parts of rural regions. Um, yeah, and back to you, Jose Luis. Thank you, Hai. Thank you, Hai, for this summary. I have to thank uh, our instructors, Yvonne Kao and Brian Dooley, for such an insightful learning session. My appreciation also to all participants for their very positive engagement. We were addressing monitoring, evaluation, and learning, a key, a key focus we had on learning. Uh, as you know, with the other management tool, learning is key. ME monitoring evaluation provides us all with an opportunity to learn. Most of you will ask what comes next. So we will be sharing a session report but we would like also this to be the first step in ensuring that our KICS activities are demand driven. Our country partners know best what is missing and what are the needs in terms of knowledge, innovation and exchange to reach the goal of improving their own national education outcomes. For instance, Carl, one of the participants today, asked if we could offer a training on M&E. &E. The answer is yes. If there is demand, we may consider it as one of the next next learning cycles, probably in collaboration with uh, our partners. Uh, we look forward to working with you all and building together our knowledge, innovation and exchange activities. You have now the links for the evaluation survey have been shared through the web for through the chat room. You can also we'll also be sending an email with those same links if you don't have time to fill them now. We thank you for all for your participation and we look forward to meeting you all soon. Thank you so much.